um, grabs electrons and becomes FADH2. Notice that FAD started out with a charge of zero. It grabbed two electrons, and then it grabbed two protons. Two electrons minus one each, two protons plus one each. FAD goes from zero to zero, no change in charge. FAD becomes FADH2. OK, so FAD is also an electron carrier that exists in cells. And we'll talk more about that later. There's the blah, blah, blah of that. OK. On the subject of energy, we know, of course, that energy is stored in the cell. Uh, one of the ways energy is stored in the cell is in the form of triphosphates. Triphosphates are very useful because, A, they contain a lot of energy, and B, that energy can be released very, very easily. It's for the same reason you have gasoline in your car. Okay? It's got a lot of energy, and that energy can be released very, very easily. ATP is the gasoline of the cell. All right, um, what do I want to say here? Nothing. Okay, and I'll pass on that. The central role of ATP. The central role of ATP is pretty amazing, okay? Your body is using ATP to um, put phosphates onto things. It's using ATP to do muscular contraction. It's using ATP to synthesize molecules. It's using ATP to move things around within cells. It's using ATP to communicate information. ATP literally is the gasoline of the cell. A very astonishing number to me is that every single day you're alive, your body makes and breaks down more than your own weight in ATP. More than the weight of your body is made and broken down in the form of ATP every single day. You thought hummingbirds were pretty active, right? Okay, That's a lot of ATP. It's a phenomenal amount of ATP. It takes an awful lot to keep you alive. Your body is using that. It tells you that most of the time your body is doing things that have nothing to do with the exercising that you're doing. There's far more energy that your body is using simply in existing than there is in any marathon you're going to run. Marathons are good. Running is good. Exercise is good. But just the cost of being alive, the cost of living, is very, very high in terms of ATP. Keeping this brain going, keeping your eyes going, take up a disproportional amount of the energy that your body needs. Remarkable. Yes, sir? You're spinning. Oh. Cool. Did you have a beer before class or? Uh, a, couple. a couple. Okay, well, good for you. Well, I'm sorry. Like, uh, so you break down your body with like more than your body weight every day. In ATP. ATP. You break down more than your body weight in ATP every day. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's true. And that's true if you were sitting here in this classroom and that's all you were doing, you would break down more than your body weight in ATP every day. That's pretty, pretty hard to grab, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it boggles my mind as well. Yes, ma'am. Well, divided by 24 hours by 60 minutes, and you'll see, right? I mean, um, the point is that it's a tremendous amount of ATP that's being made and broken down. You don't make ATP out of nothing. You have to make ATP out of energy sources, which is why you're eating. Now you've got a reason to go have that beer. You got a reason to go eat that food, right? Okay, I've got to make my ATP. Now don't you feel better? It's okay, I've got to make a lot of ATP, man. I'm not making that number up, it's true. All right, so we need ATP to make things. Okay, well how do we make ATP? We can make ATP by breaking down things. Is that a conundrum? No. If we were making and breaking down the same things without eating, that would be a conundrum. Because we won't get as much energy out as we put into what we make. But since we're eating, we're taking in exogenous things. That's where our excess energy is coming from. Okay? Or if we're on a diet, then we're hopefully we're pulling it off of stores. But, I, but that doesn't always happen. 
Okay, uh, let's see. This guy, I'll just show you, nothing, no real point about it, just to show you what it looks like. You hear a lot about CoA, and we'll talk about CoA later in the term. Coenzyme A is a um, molecule that contains a, a vitamin. Uh, panathenic acid is, is a, a vitamin. And it's needed to make CoA. CoA is used as a carrier in the cell. And this carrier that's in the cell, um, I like to think of as a, as a common handle. We see this getting attached to fatty acids. And the cell knows by the fact that it grabs a hold of the CoA part that what it's got is a fatty acid on the <laughs> other end. That's a useful thing. We'll see why, how that occurs later. OK, and uh, blah, blah. We'll talk about that later. OK, that's pretty much what I want to say about energy. Are there any questions about that? We're getting close to metabolism. We're now going to talk about structure of carbohydrates. And carbohydrates, understanding uh, their structures is important because that will become important as we start talking about how we break them down. The structures of carbohydrates um, have a lot of nomenclature, and I find for a lot of students, you covered this in organic chemistry, it is frequently a review. Uh, so bear with me as I review this with you. We talk, we talk about sugars as being carbohydrates. We talk about them as being saccharides. We call them monosaccharides, disaccharides, trisaccharides, polysaccharides. All these names relate to things that have or are sugars. What do they mean? Okay. Well, carbohydrate literally means a water form of carbon. A water form of carbon. Why do we call it that? Well, it's because if we look at the carbohydrates, glucose is a real good example. The structure of glucose is C6H12O6, which could be written as C6 parentheses H2O6. Right? Glucose is a hydrate of six carbons. So carbohydrate, that's what that name derives from. Okay? Saccharide, where does that come from? Saccharide comes from, I believe, Latin, meaning sweet taste. So a saccharide is something that has a sweet taste. The sweet taste, um, at least in the old world, came only from sugars. So that's, that's where they derived their name. We call something a monosaccharide if it contains one sugar uh, a molecule. We call it a disaccharide if it contains two. We call it a polysaccharide if it contains many. We call it an oligosaccharide if it contains a few. No exact number on what oligo is. Typically, it's, it's 10 or less, but that's, that's approximately what we're talking about. OK. Whenever you see the designation OSE on the end of a name, that molecule is a sugar. OSE means sugar. That's why we have glucose, fructose, sucrose. All those are relating to the fact that those are all sugars. A triose is a sugar that contains three carbons. Tri meaning three. A tetrose is a sugar that contains four carbons. You can start to see where this is going. A pentose contains five carbons. A hexose contains six. An octose contains eight. We don't usually see much above eight. Eight's about the biggest we see in terms of sugars. And yes, heptose, there are heptoses that are known. That means seven. OK. All right. So those are some simple naming things for uh, sugars. Let's see some more things related to that. Well, first, let's look at the trioses. OK. A triose is a sugar that contains three carbons. From what I've just told you, you should be able to write the formula for a simple triose. It would be C3, H2O in parentheses, with a three. Meaning it would be C3H6O3. Okay? These are both three carbon sugars. They're both trioses. You'll notice that one of them is an aldehyde. It's called glyceraldehyde. The other one is a ketone. It's called dihydroxyacetone. Okay? You'll see more about these molecules later when we talk about glycolysis. But notice that they're fundamentally different in a, chemi in a chemical perspective, but they are both C3 
H6, O3. Chemically, they're different. Aldehydes are more readily oxidizable than ketones are. <clears throat> and we'll see how that comes into play when we talk about glucose and fructose later. Okay. And another thing that we see is if we look at that middle carbon in glyceraldehyde and we look at the different things that are attached to it, we see that there are four different groups attached to glyceraldehyde, meaning that there are two different stereoisomers of glyceraldehyde. Dihydroxyacetone doesn't have that. Its carbon is only attached to three different things. Okay. Here's D-glyceraldehyde, here's L-glyceraldehyde. How do I tell the difference between D and L? Well, we can do the, the R and S designation, which everybody likes about as much as I do, which is not very much. Or we can do the simple, dumb biochemical designation, which I happen to like because it is simple and it doesn't take too much memory. We'll see sugars have a variety of different configurations. Sugars will have multiple carbons that have possible different configurations. We tell D and L by a very simple designation. We look at the next to the bottom carbon. In this case, there's only one. The next to the bottom carbon, and we say if the OH is on the right side, that's a D sugar. And if the OH is on the left side, it's an L sugar. There's another, another term that we use to describe these two different sugars. Glyceraldehyde has an aldehyde group. It's called an aldose, not surprisingly. Aldehyde sugar, aldose. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate has a ketone group, and not surprisingly, we call it a ketose. I could describe glyceraldehyde as an aldotriose. If I wanted to, I could probably call it a trialdose. And to be honest with you, I, I would count either one of those correct for you, although technically people would probably want to call it an, uh, an aldotriose as opposed to a trialdose. But the main thing is you get all the various descriptors that are in there. Okay. Let's look at some other sugars. Okay. Here's glucose. Here's fructose. Which one's the aldose? Glucose is the aldose, right? Which one's the, which one's the ketose? Well, clearly, this guy's the ketose, right? Oh, besides the fact that it says that. Uh, you know, I've got to remember when I write that exam not to put that on there, because I, I don't want to help you guys any more than necessary here, right? OK, so we've got glucose, we've got fructose. Now, this is D-glucose, and here is L-glucose. Look at the difference between these two. Notice that L we didn't make simply by flipping the last carbon, which is this one right here. L-glucose is a mirror image of D-glucose. Don't forget that. I know professors in biochemistry who forget that. They want to make an L-glucose by simply saying, OK, we'll put this carbon, we'll put this hydroxide over here, and we've got L-glucose, and they're very wrong. To make L-glucose, you've got to make the mirror image of D-glucose, meaning I've got to flip every single one of these flipping things, as it were, right? Everybody got that? That's true for any sugar. You have to flip them all. If I wanted to make D-fructose, I mean, I'm sorry, if I wanted to make L-fructose, I would flip, 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 and I would have L-fructose. Yes, sir? That's the only one that really matters biologically. Because if we start flipping the other ones, we give them different names. Yeah. So if I, if I take this guy here, for example, and I flip this guy over here, I make galactose. Make sense? All right. Now, mirror images have a name of their own. They're called enantiomers. 